In this Lex Friedman podcast, he has guest Paul Rosoli, a conservationist, explorer, author, and filmmaker who has been living in the Amazon for over 17 years. Paul shares his experience of encountering a 25-foot dormant anaconda snake in the starlight. Paul recalls feeling inspired to capture the moment, stating that, If we could somehow show people this, it will be on the front cover of the National Geographic and we can protect all the jungle that we want. However, instead of capturing the snake, Paul ends up wrapping his arms around the anaconda to feel its power and muscle as it slowly slips away into the darkness. He believes that people often fear snakes because they do not understand them and associate them with evil and sneakiness. However, Rosoli shows that interacting with snakes can be done in a calm and gentle manner, which leads to people developing a sense of wonder and appreciation for these creatures. The conversation also touches on a specific type of snake, the anaconda, and how to interact with them. Rosoli describes how he and his team have had to learn how to handle these massive snakes, some up to 25 feet long, and with a girth the size of a basketball. He explains that it is not difficult to physically hold the snake but rather the scary part is the moment of hesitation before grabbing it, which can be compared to crossing a street with a bus coming. He also recalls the dangerous moment when he was caught by the snake's coils and how he was saved by his teammate. The conversation then shifts to the mercury contamination problem in the Amazon due to artisanal gold mining, which has caused birth defects in the local population. Rose Soli explains that studying anacondas can help us understand how mercury moves through the ecosystem and how to prevent further damage. He emphasizes the importance of studying apex predators like anacondas and using them as ambassadors for wildlife. He explains how he got access to the gold mining areas, which are known to be extremely dangerous due to the violence and lawlessness associated with it. He describes the machine gun limit, which is the border of the area where the rainforest has been cut and destroyed and the gold miners operate. Paul explains that the Russian guys he met had a legal mining concession and allowed him access to the area. While he was there, he witnessed the deforestation, dead animals, and negligence of the gold miners towards human health and the environment. He also notes that the gold miners are notorious for killing people who interfere with their activity. Despite this, Paul believes it is possible to convert gold miners into conservationists, as they need to understand the value of the rainforest for tourism and ecotourism. He relates his experience with one gold miner he met, showing him pictures of tourists, and explaining how they are fed and shown different species. He hopes that education and awareness can help turn the tide against this ecological crime. Paul Rosoli Rosoli then talks about his efforts to protect the Amazon rainforest through ecotourism and by giving loggers and extractors job opportunities to protect the rainforest instead of destroying it. He acknowledges that many of the loggers are friends of his and forest people who need to make a living. They have an affinity for the jungle and its outdoors, and so when presented with job opportunities to protect the rainforest, they took it up. He further explains how many loggers only cut down the more valuable trees such as mahogany, which holds 60% of the carbon of the whole rainforest and have an outsized disproportionate mass from the ancient density of the wood. This is detrimental to the environment because it reduces carbon sequestration in the rainforest. To raise awareness of the Amazon's situation, Rosoli believed that he needed to do something dramatic that would garner attention. The idea of being swallowed by an anaconda while wearing a suit that could shield him was one of the attempts he made to raise awareness. However successful or not, Rosalie's goal was to do something to protect the rainforest and bring attention to its plight. Rosoli shares his experience of coming up with an idea to feature anacondas as a means of highlighting a broader discussion around environmental issues. He suggests that people often switch off or turn away from coverage on issues like the rainforest because of how sad or uninteresting it may be to them. He explains how he first suggested showcasing the largest anacondas in the world to a producer, and then how the producer suggested the idea of being eaten alive by an anaconda to which Rosoli agreed after some encouragement. Rosalie's experience suggests that media outlets may not always be interested in serious coverage or willing to properly consult with experts, that changes in the message or narrative of a piece can significantly alter its intended message, and that collaboration with the producer and participants is critical to ensure that the content has relevance, coherency, and ethical standards. Paul Rosoli had faced backlash and criticism after a controversial documentary was released by Discovery Channel. The documentary involved Rosoli attempting to be eaten by an anaconda, which caused outrage among the viewers and animal rights activists. Rosoli received death threats and had to leave the country for six months after the incident. He expressed his disappointment at how the important message of the documentary had been washed out by the sensationalism, as it was intended to show the dangers of human interference in wildlife habitats. However, he acknowledges that it was a learning experience for him, and he now knows how contracts should be structured and how the media industry works. Rosoli believes in the power of social media as a tool to communicate important messages and raise awareness in society. Additionally, he mentions that working with a small team of people who share the passion for the cause and producing genuine content is essential to creating something that will inspire and have an impact. 
The conversation then shifts to a story about the Amazon fire of 2019. Paul talks about how he was filming a documentary and stumbled upon a spot with 70-foot flames. He lost it and used his phone to document the scene. A month later, he posted the video on Instagram, which went viral and led to him becoming a spokesperson for the Amazon. He talks about the importance of communicating with people and bringing them into that reality, whether it's about rhino or elephant poaching or the destruction of the Amazon. At the end of the story, Paul discusses how Canadian entrepreneur who started Lightspeed reached out to him a few months after the video went viral. This led to a turning point in his life as he had no job, savings, or money before the video. He also shared how Joe Rogan shared Paul's video, which helped it gain traction. Rosoli briefly recounts how his friend Dax provided funding to develop a ranger program to protect acres of rainforest and ecosystems. The conversation then turns to Rosalie's experiences in the jungle, including his interactions with jaguars. He shares a story about how a jaguar came up to him while he was sleeping in a hammock and he was able to remain calm and unafraid, feeling a connection to the cat and energized by the experience. The conversation then turns to how Rosoli survives on solo hikes through the jungle. He explains the different components, such as having a hammock and non-perishable food, and how starting a fire in the Amazon is futile. Rosoli explains that staying dry is impossible in the jungle and that infections are more likely as a result. He even shares a personal experience of contracting MRSA and becoming extremely ill while living in the jungle. While staying in the jungle, Rose Soli has learned to hunt and fish for food, but he also brings nuts and other non-perishable food items to supplement his diet. He mentions that he often uses diesel to start a fire and cook his food, as it burns slowly and can dry out wet kindling. Rose Soli also discusses the differences between his survival skills and those of the local natives, who seem to have all the cheat codes and can catch giant fish with ease. While Rose Soli was studying reptiles and amphibians in the Amazon rainforest, he became infected with a bacteria after being bitten by a venomous snake. He was unable to get help and had a fever, and in a weakened state, he encountered loggers who were carrying dead animals they had hunted and planned to sell. When he finally made it back to civilization, he was taken to a hospital where he spent five days receiving four antibiotics. Despite the ordeal, Rose Soli managed to persevere and survive, though he described it as an experience in which he had no strength, simply the will to move forward. He even wrote a goodbye letter to his parents, fearing he would not make it out alive. He also discussed spot flies, a common parasite that can infect humans and other mammals in the Amazon rainforest. Rosoli mentioned the use of certain medicinal plants that can cure infections in the jungle. Rosoli describes how going into the jungle brings a sense of curiosity and wonder, and how being surrounded by so many living creatures at night can be overwhelming. He likens life in the Amazon to a churning death march, where creatures of all kinds eat and are eaten leading to a heightened awareness of the temporary nature of life. Rose Soli also notes that while the violence of the natural world can seem cruel and inexplicable, for him it takes on almost religious significance as a reminder of humanity's own impermanence. They also discuss the process of removing bot flies from the body in the jungle. Rose Soli explains that to remove bot flies, they have to put an irritant, like the tar from a cigarette, over the hole and then wait for the bot fly to come up and then grab it with a tweezer. He also mentions that JJ has special pliers to remove bot flies from people. The process can be painful, and there is a risk of infection if not done correctly. The conversation then shifts to talking about the jungle and the creatures that inhabit it. Rose Soli shares his fascination with giant anteaters and the intimate relationship they have with their young. He even has personal experience with the baby anteater that he rescued and spent weeks teaching how to find ants and caring for it like his own child. This experience allowed him to understand the jungle from the perspective of an animal and see how emotions can manifest in different creatures. He then talks about his experiences with elephants in India and his admiration for their intelligence. He mentions how he lived with a semi-wild herd of elephants, which changed his view of reality. He observed the matriarch of the herd walk up to a pregnant human and call all the other elephants. He talks about how the elephants preferred water from a well in their village over the stream or lake water. He also shared an interesting anecdote about a tuskless male elephant named Dharma, who would wander around the forest not knowing who to hang out with. Rosoli describes how he became really good friends with Dharma and how the elephant had a tantrum during a tiger call, which involved throwing things and demanding bananas. Despite his efforts to outsmart the elephant, Rosoli had to give in to Dharma's demands. Rosoli explains how scientists often measure elephant intelligence using human-based tests, but he believes their intelligence goes beyond just solving puzzles. He also talks about the African elephant population, which is down to 2% of what it was a few hundred years ago. He explains that some elephants are being born tuskless because poaching has taken down the great tuskers to the point where it's beneficial for some elephants to not have tusks. However, this has caused deformed elephants, and tusks are fundamental to the interaction between elephants, especially in the context of males competing with each other for mating rights. 
The size of tusks can also be a factor in winning mating rights. Rosoli explains that tusks are not just a competitive tool, but may also have a visual beautiful component that could be appealing to females. He then goes on to discuss the philosophical question about what intelligence is and whether humans are just a different kind of animal or truly unique. Rosoli finds it hard to understand the anti-human sentiment in environmentalism as humans are clearly unique in nature and have altered the entire planet. He celebrates what makes humans human, including the ability to puzzle solve, create tools, and the arts. Finally, Friedman and Rosoli discuss the invention that has had the most impact on humanity, with Rosoli suggesting flying rather than the commonly cited invention of fire. Rosoli believes that the ability to fly is shocking in terms of its usefulness, but also in terms of its ability to inspire people. He cites the fact that being able to look up and see the stars due to Earth's atmosphere is important as it allows us to see that there is a big world out there that we don't know much about, inspiring exploration. The conversation then shifts to the idea of exploring other planets, and the possibility of a child born on another planet looking back at Earth with a sense of wonder. Rosoli admits to a longing to explore, particularly in rivers, streams, oceans, and jungles. However, he states that he loves Earth so much that he wouldn't even leave to go to the moon. The conversation then changes to the most dangerous animal in the Amazon, with Rosoli stating that it is humans, particularly uncontacted tribes who are afraid of the outside world due to the trauma of the rubber boom. There is a debate about whether or not to bring these tribes into contact with the modern world. Rosoli emphasizes the need to understand and respect their isolation and way of life. He then describes the dangerous encounters that people have had with uncontacted tribes in the Amazon rainforest. One example given is of a man who is out with his wife and is attacked by a tribe who starts shooting arrows at them. The man gets an arrow through his leg and is subsequently ripped apart by the tribe. Another example is given of a group of loggers who tried to steal trees from the tribes and were attacked with arrows, leaving them with injuries and arrows sticking out of their bodies. The episode explains that the attitudes towards outsiders, or white people, stem from the rubber boom era, when the natives were abused and enslaved by foreign gangs on the hunt for rubber. This led to the tribes retreating into the jungle and developing their own ways of protecting themselves from outsiders. The tribes are said to be nomadic and use six-foot bows and seven-foot arrows with bamboo tips sharpened into razor blades. The episode warns that even well-meaning outsiders can be met with violence, as illustrated by a story of a ranger who was attacked with an arrow when trying to offer bananas to the tribes. They emphasize the importance of respecting the tribe's territory and traditions, as invading their space can lead to dangerous consequences. Rosoli then discusses his experience of going on a solo journey through the Amazon. He talks about the realization he had about the significance of human contact, after being alone for a week. Rosoli felt uncomfortable and experienced a distortion of reality, feeling disconnected from the world and hallucinating. He also shares how other people's stories about the jungle creatures, like capuchins and crocodiles, added to his anxiety causing him to hallucinate about the animals. Rosoli even woke up one night to find many black caimans outside his tent, looking at him. However, he did not believe the jungle was dangerous, but rather that humans were more dangerous. Despite the dangers that exist, Rosoli has grasped and captured many creatures, although he does not necessarily consider himself as an expert in doing so. The conversation goes on about his mistake of leaving a fish outside his tent, which attracted crocodiles. He admits to being a little too cavalier and acknowledges the general rule of not inviting wild animals into your camping area. Rosalie wanted to reach the end of the tributary, which was a pilgrimage for him to venture into the heart of everything he was fascinated with. Rosoli describes how he was prepared to document and explore the river, but as he traveled further upstream, things became weirder and more intense. He had to rely on pictures and magazines as he didn't have access to a reliable phone or power bank. Eventually, he reached a point where he saw smoke around the next bend and he knew that he was approaching an uncontacted tribe. He could see a few naked people on the other side of the river and they were clearly defending their territory, armed with arrows and bows. Rosoli was aware of the stories of other people who had encountered these tribes and weren't so lucky. He also had nothing to defend himself with, so he turned around and ran for three hours before getting into the river and swimming. Rosoli eventually inflated a pack raft to continue his journey down the river which took him through the night until his headlamp died. He reached a point where he could no longer continue and fell asleep. However, he was jolted awake by a dream of hearing voices outside his tent. Rosoli then encountered a giant black caiman, which didn't scare him as much as the possibility of encountering the uncontacted tribe. When he returned to town, Rosoli realized how much he appreciated the simple things in life, like being able to hug his parents. When asked about the uncontacted tribe, Rosoli said that they are like any other Amazonian natives who are tall with genetics that support their lifestyle. He also mentioned that they are just people, and while there are stories of people being killed by these tribes, it is possible to coexist with them if contact is made in a respectful manner. He talks about how these people have their own culture, 
medicines, and hunting practices that are unique to them and not understood by outsiders. For example, the indigenous people can hit a spider monkey out of a 160-foot tree with a bamboo arrow, which is a remarkable hunting skill. They also have the ability to survive in the jungle without the aid of modern tools such as matches and gasoline, relying instead on friction to start fires. Rosoli mentions that there is much to learn from the survival skills of these people that could be applied to other fields. Rosoli also touches on the incredible biodiversity of the Amazon rainforest, including creatures that have not been discovered or named yet. He describes climbing trees, up to 50 feet high, to explore and inventory the life within the canopy. He compares the experience to the movie Avatar, where characters explore the floating islands. Rosoli notes that not many scientists have had the opportunity to explore the canopy of the Amazon, and so there is much that remains undiscovered. The topic then shifts to the bullet ant, which is known to have the most painful bite in the world. Rosoli explains that he has been bitten by a bullet ant seven or eight times, and the sensation is much worse than a typical bee sting. The venom causes a full body, full mind experience that can lead to sweating, coldness, fatigue, blurry vision, and extreme discomfort. Despite this, some people in the Amazon put their hands in gloves containing 70 bullet ants, a practice that Rosoli finds unimaginable. Rosoli references the reports of great civilizations in the Amazon from Oriana's trip down the river, which were later confirmed to be gone when people checked on them hundreds of years later. He suggests that disease may have wiped out these civilizations, but also acknowledges that there is a long history of complex civilizations in the Amazon. The host, Freeman, asks Rosoli to steal man and criticize the idea that there were advanced ancient civilizations in the Amazon, and Rosoli responds that while it is true that we are discovering more information about these civilizations, some people take it too far by claiming that the entire ecosystem of the Amazon was created by humans. He calls this idea ridiculous, saying that it's unlikely humans could engineer such a complex ecosystem. Rosoli worries that this type of thinking may lead to a lack of concern for preserving the Amazon, as people may think they can always engineer it. He also points out that there are some things we know humans have engineered in the Amazon, such as banana plants, but suggests that the Amazon as a whole is one of the most authentically natural things. Finally, the conversation turns to a discussion of how long it would take for all signs of human existence to disappear if humans were to die out, with Rosoli suggesting it could be anywhere from a few thousand years to a hundred thousand years. Rosoli talks about the topic of nature and man's relationship to it. Rosoli describes his experiences in the Amazon rainforest, where he feels an overwhelming sense of being a part of nature rather than separate from it. He discusses the insects and animals that are both enemies and just part of the natural world. For example, he compares being bitten by a bullet and to fair play and even feeling one with a mosquito that is trying to kill him. Rosoli highlights the importance of being self-sufficient and being able to adapt to tough conditions. He also draws inspiration from the stories of historical figures like Francisco de Arellana, an explorer who led an expedition down the Amazon in the 16th century. For Rosoli, being immersed in nature and facing harsh conditions is a way to test one's own toughness and resilience. They discuss how we are becoming more interconnected globally with the emergence of AI and the internet, and how this presents an opportunity for us to make a choice about the fate of our planet's ecosystems, particularly the ocean and rainforests. Paul emphasizes the importance of protecting animal species that we have grown up with and know something to, and expresses concern about how humans treat animals such as elephants. The conversation then turns towards the idea of immortality and the potential negative consequences of trying to escape the beauty of the earth. Paul acknowledges that there have been technological advancements in the past that were initially met with skepticism but later proved to be beneficial, and believes that we will learn our way through the development of AI. He cites his experience with legged robots as an example of how we can see lifelike qualities in non-biological creatures. However, he maintains that he still prefers biological dogs to robotic ones, and wonders about the deep love that humans have for dogs, and how this may apply to other alien civilizations. Lex expresses his discomfort in the idea that an artificially intelligent robot can have consciousness. He fears that consciousness could easily be faked, and we could live in a world where people have deeper connections with their toasters than their romantic partners. They later shift their discussion to climate change and its impact on the Amazon rainforest. Though Paul admits he is not a climate scientist, he believes that changes in weather patterns and biodiversity loss are evident, and individuals need to pick one thing to fight for to make a difference. He adds that instead of arguing over the degree of damage that climate change will bring, individuals should focus on combating issues like deforestation and the decline of animals in the wild. The two then discuss Jordan Peterson's criticism that the complexity of the climate system makes it impossible to make conclusive statements, and the fear-mongering surrounding climate change. Rosoli expressed his admiration for Jordan Peterson, but he cringed a bit at Peterson's dismissal of the ecological emergency happening right now. Rosoli also noted his concern about the doomsday anti-human sentiment that some environmental groups promote. 
He suggested that people should focus on one thing at a time and practice being effective in their actions. He reminded people that wildlife has declined by 70% in the last 50 years, and the need to protect biodiversity is urgent. He believes that the preservation of wild tigers and other species is crucial because they have their own inherent right to exist. However, he mentions that he often gets criticized for not being a vegan, but he explains that asking people in remote villages in the Amazon to give up their traditional diet is not practical. The conversation then shifts to Jordan Peterson and how his focus on human psychology and theology can cause him to miss the bigger picture of the intelligence of other species. Rosoli thinks that it's important for humans to be deeply aware of nature and our evolutionary history, which can give us a broader perspective on our place in the world. He believes that many people who live in cities forget that we share this planet with other living things and that being in nature can make us feel more at home. In fact, Rosoli suggests that being in nature can even be a spiritual experience and he would like to take Lex Friedman to see giant trees and meet the old gods. He explains that he is always amazed by the nature that surrounds him and provides an example of how thousands of butterflies gather in one spot during the dry season. He hopes to capture this phenomenon on camera and showcase it to people. Additionally, they discuss the idea that protecting cameras or equipment too much can actually result in more harm. Rosoli argues that his cameras have been through wear and tear, but have proven to be tough and reliable over time. The two also discuss hunting and poaching, with Rosoli expressing a strong disdain for poachers but noting that hunting plays an important role in preserving wildlife. He works with an organization called VEPAW that uses post-9-11 veterans to protect black and white rhinos and elephants in Africa, and he also mentions the Buffalo Kloof Reserve where animals are hunted responsibly and ethically. Rosoli describes the mindset he develops when he is completely stripped down in the Amazon with just a headlamp and machete. He explains that he is resilient and tries to be as mentally stable as those who have survived worse situations. Rosoli compares his mindset to that of Elon Musk who constantly puts out fires having to run several companies. When faced with challenges, he always tries to move forward and solve problems. However, Rosoli acknowledges that there may have been some ego involved when he was younger and went out into the woods with just one match, a hunting knife, and a dog. Nonetheless, he emphasizes that he tries to strike a balance between adventure and tragedy and is not motivated by ego when exploring the Amazon. When faced with death, he says he is very calm and accepting, which is reassuring. The host mentions Werner Herzog and his documentaries about people who ventured into the wild and never came back. Rosoli explains how quickly bodies can be consumed in the Amazon, and how he thought he was going to be the next person to disappear. He goes on to describe the documentary, Grizzly Man, and shares his admiration for Herzog's storytelling. He also talks about Herzog's documentary, The Burden of Dreams, which is set in the Amazon and portrays the sheer madness of trying to replicate hauling a boat over a mountain. Rosoli differentiates between responsible hunters, who hunt non-endangered game species, and poachers, who kill recklessly and sell animal parts. Friedman expresses his own interest in traveling with Rosoli to hunt and eat meat, as he believes that it is more ethical and allows for a deeper connection with nature. They both agree that factory farming is problematic, and that hunting and fishing can be a more intimate and responsible way of obtaining meat. Rosoli also emphasizes the importance of wild ecosystems and how people whose livelihoods depend on them will fight to protect them. They discuss the meaning behind ayahuasca, an indigenous shamanistic plant medicine, and how it reveals the heart of darkness in the jungle. Rose Soli clarifies that ayahuasca can only be done in the jungle, and it cannot be done outside of its natural environment. I in this portion of the Lex Friedman podcast, guest Paul Rose Soli discusses his experience with ayahuasca, a powerful psychedelic plant mixture traditionally used in South America for spiritual and medicinal purposes. Rosoli describes feeling unprepared for the intensity of the experience, which involved drinking the ayahuasca brew in a circle with native practitioners and then embarking on a deeply introspective and profound journey through the universe. He notes that the experience showed him the thing he was scared of the most, which was the cold, dark nothingness at the basement of the universe, but also highlighted the beauty, life, and love that he had previously taken for granted in the world. Despite the transformative nature of the ayahuasca experience, Rosoli notes that he strongly suggests people start with more conventional psychedelics like mushrooms before trying ayahuasca, unless they feel completely ready for such a powerful and potentially overwhelming experience. At one point, Paul shares his experience with an ayahuasca ceremony where he found a shaman lying naked in a stream after drinking a brew causing him to retire from ayahuasca. Lex expresses his fascination with exploring the limits of his mind and his willingness to push himself to tough places. However, Paul sees the need to be cautious about what he dedicates his life to and would only want to pursue something that he believes in before dying for it. The conversation then turns to the question of the meaning of life, to which Paul responds that he finds himself in a constant state of awe and believes that there must be a deeper meaning to it all. 
He reflects on the simplest things that amaze him and hopes that the universe has created us to see what's possible and seeks to protect the things he loves, making it his mission. Rosoli also brings up the issue of climate change and its impact on the Amazon rainforest. He explains that the trees in the forest act as a carbon sink and absorb a significant amount of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. However, deforestation and fires release that carbon back into the atmosphere, exacerbating the effects of climate change. Rosoli believes that animals are not just programmed automatons, but can also show compassion and other human-like emotions. He draws wisdom from his mentor Jane Goodall, who broke all the rules and assigned emotions to animals, which paid off in dividends for her research. Rosoli also believes that different species have different emotions, especially mammals. The host ponders the complexity of an insect like a praying mantis or spider, showcasing how they are able to make difficult decisions with limited cognitive abilities. The guest, Paul Rosoli, recounts a personal experience in the jungle where a dove used him to escape from a predatory bird, showcasing the intelligence animals hold to make calculated moves. The conversation then shifts to JJ, a local jungle man whom Rosoli describes as the most skilled he has ever seen. JJ's experience growing up barefoot in the Amazon has given him an incredible ability to navigate and communicate with animals. This expertise allows him to predict and detect things that others cannot, such as a nearby peccary or the presence of a jaguar. The guest praises JJ's ability to construct the crime scene like Sherlock Holmes at work, showcasing the precision and accuracy of his analysis. He explains that he views each species as if it were a person, understanding their habits, perspective, and intentions. For example, he speaks of a jaguar as if she were someone with her own personal preferences and emotions. He also tells a story about catching a large fish and then releasing it back into the water because he felt bad watching it gasp for air on the sand. When he pretended that the fish had escaped, a local man named Santiago Duran saw through his lie and called him out on it. The discussion then transitions to Duran himself, who was a former police officer and canoe pilot in his youth. He had lived in the jungle his whole life and had incredible experiences including encountering uncontacted tribes and seeing anacondas eat large animals. He also shared a secret with Rosoli that led him to the floating forest, a sacred location where large anacondas could be found. This experience helped solidify Rosalie's identity and passion for the jungle, which he views as intrinsically connected to his own existence. They were in Peru, and the conversation touches upon other South American nations that encompass the Amazon, including Brazil and Ecuador. The guest brings up their experiences in the western Amazon lowlands, specifically in the Madre de Dios region of Peru, which is known as the Mother of God, due to the jungle being the source of all life. Paul shares his personal connection to the area, having been integrated into the local culture through his interactions with the indigenous community, specifically a man named Santiago Duran who helped unite scattered tribes in the jungle and protect the region from being bulldozed. The guest also discusses his journey of looking for anacondas, the largest snakes on earth, and the impact they have on the ecosystem as apex predators. Despite the challenges of finding these snakes, the guest and his team eventually captured a 12-foot anaconda, which was considered small by the standards of the area. Overall, the section highlights the importance of protecting and preserving the natural world, as well as the value of building relationships with local communities to understand and appreciate the beauty and complexity of different environments. Paul Rosoli and JJ explore the Amazon jungle and encounter a 25-foot anaconda while walking on floating grass. JJ is frightened and thinks that anacondas are listening to them, but Paul assures him that they do not have ears. They come across the massive snake with another 16-foot anaconda sprawled across her. Paul tries to catch the anaconda by jumping on it, but it slips into the darkness, leaving him unharmed. They return from the trip, realizing that the parameters of what they thought was reality were just a tiny fraction of what's out there in the wild. Paul explains that anacondas are not aggressive towards humans, and most of the time, they choose flight over fight. They are not a threat unless someone tries to hold on or catch them. Paul has handled over 80 anacondas in the field, and none of them have bitten him. Snakes, in general, are not aggressive, even a rattlesnake will warn people with its rattle rather than directly attacking them. The story of anaconda eating people is often exaggerated or rare occurrences when someone is drunk and goes for a midnight swim in an Amazonian lake. Check out the full podcast by clicking the link in the description below. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe for more content like this. Thank you for listening to this podcast summary episode of The Pod Slice.